Welcome to Standard 10A and welcome officially to the 20th century in the course you've now crossed over into the 1900s. In this presentation we're going to take a look at the major causes, events, and leaders of World War I. This is a two-part presentation. We're going to focus in this first part on the major causes of World War I. The essential question that we'll answer in this first part of the presentation is what were the factors, what were the major causes that produced or led to World War I or the Great War as it was known at the time? Uh, some essential understanding here, the World War I uh, was fought during the four years 1914 through 1918. We want to know that time frame, so about 100 years ago. Uh, and it was caused by the competition that existed among these industrialized countries in Europe. We just finished in Standard 9 studying the Industrial Revolution. It had created these intense rivalries, economic and military rivalries between the major European powers. It was also the result of a failure in diplomacy. Diplomacy refers to negotiations between countries. You may have heard the word diplomats are people who negotiate for countries with other countries. Diplomacy is the actual uh, negotiations. The first piece of essential knowledge we want to know are the main causes, the long-term causes in the decades leading up to World War I, in the roughly 50 years before the war. What were the things that were building up, increasing the tension between these countries that will eventually erupt into World War I? Notice the word main is in parentheses here because conveniently the four main causes each begin with one of the letters in the word main. The first of these causes is the word militarism. And if we take a look at the little boy in this picture, we kind of get a sense of what militarism is all about. It's the glorification, it's the emphasis in society of all things military. Okay, um, we, we see in this picture militarism. As I was putting this presentation together, I came across uh, these trading cards that kids in England could trade back around 1900 uh, showing military leaders. Again, you might have traded basketball or football or baseball cards as kids. Uh, in the case of England here around 1900, kids could trade admirals for generals and all sorts of, of military leaders. That's kind of that emphasis on the military that we're talking about. And it was fueled largely by the amount of money, time, resources put into building these armies. The armies uh, were seen as a representation of, of the country. Okay, the stronger the army, the stronger and prouder the country was. And we see all the major European countries at the start of World War I had massive armies, all over half a million soldiers in the armies, even two million soldiers in the German army. Okay, so these all were uh, examples of militarism. Okay, the A in our main causes is the word alliances. An ally is a friend, and an alliance is an agreement between friendly countries. In this case, these agreements were to defend each other if there was a war. Okay, even before World War I broke out, because of these intense rivalries, uh, these countries formed partnerships. They formed friendships. And just like you may have told a friend, I'm there for you anytime you need me, these countries sort of said the same thing. The problem with these alliances in Europe in 1914 is they were largely secret. Nobody really knew who had whose back. We can see, of course, now color code on our map who the alliances were. Um, the uh, one side of World War I were the Allies, and um, they were made up largely of the United Kingdom, or England, France, and Russia. This is the side that we'll see in the second part of the presentation. The United States joins, but not until much later 
in the war. The Allies were fighting against the Central Powers. Okay, the Central Powers, uh, you can see just from the geography where their locations are, is why they're called the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Again, we saw the Ottomans much earlier in the course. Um, World War I will really be the end, uh, both of Austria-Hungary and, and the Ottoman Empire. We see in these political cartoons the idea of the alliances. All the characters in this first one represent different countries, and we notice the tangled web of arms here almost looks like a spider web. You know, think about your circle of friends. You might be friends with two people who aren't friends with each other, and that makes some complicated uh, circles of friends. And Europe was kind of the same way here. We see this tangled web of friendships and alliances. This was a German cartoon, shows a little more straightforward Germany on the right with its ally Austria-Hungary in a tug of war against Russia, England, France, and all of its allies on, on the other side. Okay, so M for militarism, A for alliances, the I is for imperialism. We saw imperialism in standard 9D and 9E. Uh, that competition for resources and large empires in Africa and Asia during the late 18, early 1900s fueled these rivalries. And just take a look at our map here of the African colonies, the colonies of European countries at the start of World War I. You could picture that uh, occasionally these countries, these European countries, got into disputes along the borders. Maybe uh, natural resources were discovered between an English and a French or a German and a French or a Belgian and a German uh, colony. And when those things happened, there were, there were conflicts. There were many, many little conflicts throughout Africa and Asia during the late 18, early 1900s. All very small, especially compared to World War I. But each one of those little conflicts just increased the likelihood of a bigger conflict. It's sort of the idea like in school, you know, it seems that whenever two students get into a big fight or an argument, it's rarely the first time that they've met. There's been kind of a build up to that point. Uh, and then the fight, the art, big argument breaks out. We can think of World War I and imperialism in sort of the same way. The Standards mentions one by name, the Boer War, which was a conflict down in South Africa between British and, and Dutch settlers okay, around the turn of the 1900s. Okay, so M for militarism, A for alliances, I for imperialism. The N, like so many things in the uh, 1800s, was nationalism. It, it's hard to underestimate what an important force on history nationalism was, even today, but especially in the 18 and into the 1900s. That intense feeling of love and pride for your country. We see it reflected here in these lyrics. Uh, this was from a uh, British opera, I promise I won't sing, uh, two English composers, Gilbert and Sullivan, wrote the HMS Pinafore, and we see in these lyrics here, despite all temptations to, be, to belong to other nations, he remains an Englishman. That's nationalism, that devotion, that loyalty to country. Um, we see it in the Olympics, which uh, just over a decade before World War I, um, just under 20, 20 years um, before World War I in 1896, the Olympics, which had been gone for centuries, are restarted largely as a way for European countries to compete, to show off their nationalism, whose athletes were faster, whose were stronger. Um, we even see it in science. You're looking here at the skull of what was known at the time as Piltdown Man, uh, dug up in England uh, around this time. Earlier in the 1800s in Germany, uh, the Neanderthal Man was, uh, was dug up and 
prior to the discovery of human remain, older human remains in Africa uh, later on in the 1900s, they, these German bones, Neanderthal man, were considered the oldest humans. English scientists trying to make a name for themselves and also fueled by nationalism, they couldn't really accept that the Germans were older than the English. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a chimpanzee they buried out. Uh, the chimpanzee skeleton out in a swamp somewhere and they dug it up and and passed it off as even older human bones to make it look like the English were older than the Germans. That's all nationalism. But of all of these, it was most intense in a region called the Balkans. Okay, And they were nicknamed the powder keg of Europe. Take a look at this map here, and we're looking at ethnic groups in Europe uh, around the time of World War I. And what I want you to notice here is how each country in Western Europe was really sort of custom-made for a group. Okay, we had Spain was for Spaniards. We had France for the French. We had England for the English. We had from Standard 8, Germany from for the Germans in, in the late 1800s. Likewise, Italy for Italians. But this area here, the Balkans, okay, notice the rainbow of colors down here, all the different ethnic groups that exist. In this political cartoon from the time we see on the pot that says Balkan Troubles, okay, a big boiling pot of tension here that the European powers were trying to keep the lid on. Okay, and we can see the main power in this area was Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary was a unified empire, but as we can see here, it wasn't unified um, in terms of the people living there. You guys know from, from school, from class, that there's no reason why different ethnic groups can't live together. There's no inherent reason why they can't get along. But in the intense nationalism of Europe a hundred years ago, each of these different groups wanted their own land. Okay? And so the tension between these groups was going to be the factor that really ignites World War I. Okay, that leads us here to the immediate cause, the event that actually starts World War I. Okay, and World War I begins with an assassination. Okay, the assassination of the guy you're looking at here, the Archduke, the, the prince, the future emperor of Austria, Hungary, Franz Ferdinand. He's murdered. An assassination is a murder. We usually use it to refer to uh, the murders of political leaders as opposed to non political leaders and he's shot and killed in Sarajevo again lots of leaders have been shot and killed John Kennedy was assassinated Martin Luther King was assassinated Gandhi's assassinated and they don't lead to world wars but because of those four causes we just looked at this assassination is going to spark a war Okay, so just to give you a quick rundown here, we can see here Austria-Hungary and its many different groups. We see the Archduke and his wife, Sophie, actually she's assassinated as well, uh, along with the Archduke. They live here in Vienna. They're Habsburgs. Again, we saw the Habsburgs way back in Standard 3. They leave Vienna to go down to Sarajevo. Notice the difference in color in this area. Vienna uh, was the capital of the Austria-Hungary, Austria but notice Sarajevo was in an area that was largely made up of Croats and Serbs, two different ethnic groups. Okay, and the Serbs in this area, they wanted that land to join next door Serbia to make a much bigger country of Serbia. The Serbs were an ethnic group, and they were a little jealous that Germans had Germany, that Italians had Italy. They wanted a big, powerful country for Serbs. One of the guys who felt this way was a guy named Princip, Gavrilo Princip. He's waiting in Sarajevo for the Archduke and his wife. We see them leaving City Hall here. Very shortly after this picture is taken, they're assassinated and killed. Okay, and again, because of those four things, the alliance system is going to kick in. Austria-Hungary has lost its future emperor. They blame Serbia and declare war. Should have been an easy war, Austria-Hungary against Serbia, but Russia was allies with Serbia. They declare war in Austria-Hungary. 
Austria-Hungary has an alliance with Germany, so Germany attacks Russia. Russia had an alliance with France, so Ru France attacks Germany. Now Great Britain attacks Germany and all of Europe is at war.